really used and not used in that term one of these days maybe. Our first song, Rise Up, O Men of God. Song before the prayer in the hour of trial. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, hallowed be thy great and wonderful name. Thank you, Father, for this day that you give to us. We thank you, Father, for the blessings in it that you have allowed us to have. We thank you, Lord, for health and safety, for comforts, for family and friends. We thank you, Father, for this church especially and for this congregation of your church here at Liberty. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have today to be with each other. Thank you, Father, we can see each other and be able to talk and visit. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement and help that we can be to each other. And we pray that you would bless us that we might grow closer to each other and closer to you, that we might be better prepared to serve, to uh, help out others, those who don't know you and those who are not a part of your church. Help us, Father, to be a blessing to each other this morning. 
And we pray, Father, you would bless us as we spend time in your word. We thank you, Father, for your word and that we have such easy access to it that we can pick it up and read it most any time. We thank you, Father, for all those who are, that uh, we're able to study with and listen to the lessons from, who are able to put in time studying your word, and who are able to teach us and remind us of things that we need to keep on our, keep on our minds that allow us to have the right attitude to remember what we are here to do and to remember what all has been done for us. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity and we pray for your blessings on the one bringing the lesson this morning that he might talk to us about something that we most need to hear at this time. Help us, Father, to have our hearts and minds focused where they should be, that we can gain the most from it, that we can be uh, better prepared for the week ahead. We thank you, Lord, for all the physical blessings of this life that you've given to us health and comforts, houses to live in, clothes to wear, food to eat. We thank you, Father, for providing us with all these, and we pray that we might not take them for granted and not waste them. We pray that we might see how we can use these to serve you. We pray that the way that we use these is pleasing in your sight. Thank you, Father, for all that we have, especially for family and friends and good relationships. Help us in all these relationships to be encouraging, to be uplifting, uh, to, to help each other. And help us, Father, keep our eyes and ears open for opportunities to help. As we all have struggles and weaknesses, and we pray that you would help us to be a blessing and to help each other, to share each other's struggles. Father, as we all have temptations and difficulties, we pray for your blessings, your strength, and your guidance. That when these difficulties come, that we might look to you for what we need. That whether it's impatience, anger, uh, greed, and there's so many different struggles that we all have, and we pray, Father, that you would help us with them. Help us, Father, to see what it is that we can do that we'll be better prepared for when these struggles come. And help us, Father, to always remember that you are there for us, and you'll provide a way of escape, that you'll take care of us, and help us to look to you and to make up our minds to do what we should do, whether it's what we want to do at the time or not. And help us, Father, please purify our hearts and our minds, our motives and our actions, so that it makes it easier for us to faithfully serve you and, and to leave these temptations behind. Thank you for all we've been given. Help us, Father, to, to not waste these. Thank you, Father, for the country and the state and the community we live in. Help us to see where we can serve you and, and where we can be a help to someone, where we can spread your word, that we might broaden the borders of your kingdom, that your church might grow in number and in faith and in effectiveness. Please use us, Father, as effective tools in your service. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his teachings. Thank you for his coming to this earth and for the example that he was. Thank you, Father, so much for his willingness to go to the cross and to die for us. Even though we are weak and sinful, and we so often fall short and don't live our lives focused on you. Thank you, Father, for this mercy and grace. Help us, Father, to be merciful and gracious to others and to show your love to the world around us. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Please forgive us when we fall short. And help us, Father, to constantly look to you, and to look to your Son for how we should live. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the table that you've put before us. Father, we ask you to be with us that we would remember the things that we are about to partake, that we would remember uh, what they stand for, Father. Father, at this time, we ask you to be with us as we partake of the loaf that represents your son's body that was nailed to the cruel cross of Calvary and sacrificed on our behalf, that through that, Father, if we remain righteous and do thy commandments, we would have a hope of a heavenly home with thee. We ask you to bless this bread again and be with us as we partake. In Jesus' name we pray. Likewise, our Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us as we partake of the fruit of the vine, for it represents the shedding of Christ's blood on the cruel cross of Calvary. We ask you to be with each and every one of us as we partake, that we may do so in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Our Lord and our Savior, we are thankful for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We, Father, we know that without you that we would have nothing, and everything that we have comes from you. Father, at this time, we ask you to be with us as we give you back a portion of what you've so richly blessed us with, and that we would do so with a giving heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Scripture reading this morning will come from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, he, that the world through him might be saved. with
Good morning. It's good to have everyone here this morning for our services. I don't notice any visitors with us this morning, but if you are, we're glad that you can be with us. We're glad those that are joining us online as well, glad that you can be with us also. It's good as always to come together to worship God. The other day I was doing some reading, and I was reading along on a story that I was reading and noticed a word that just didn't make sense to me. I thought, you know, the author of this article just didn't know what they were saying. It didn't seem right in the context, and I got industrious, wanted to check it out, and I looked up the meaning of that word. And as I looked up the meaning of the word, I realized that I knew one definition of the word, but there were several other definitions. And once I saw those other definitions, I realized it did make sense with one of those other definitions. I learned something new. You know, sometimes I realize there's things that I used to know that I have forgotten. You know, it, my educational experience has gotten further and further back over the years, and you might can relate to that. Plus, we need to realize that our education, our learning is an ongoing process. There's always more to learn. You know, maybe we need to expand our vocabulary, expand our learning in other ways. It's not just vocabulary, but other ways as well. But there's some words that are easy to define. There are other words that are a little bit more difficult. This morning, I want us to talk about the word love and look at one particular part of that word love. If I were to ask you to define love, how would you define love? Someone might say, well, well, what kind of love are you talking about? Are you talking about a husband and wife and their love for one another? Are you talking about parents to their children or children to their parents? Perhaps you're talking about you know, loving a beautiful sunshiny day or loving a good night's sleep or certain foods that you might love as well. What kind of love do you mean? And we realize there's different ways we use that word. It can mean a lot of different things. But even if we define it and say we're talking about the love that we have for God or the love that we have for a hus between a husband and wife, how do you describe love? It's one of those words that might be a little difficult at times because there's so much in that's within that. I think I've mentioned a number of times before that one of the definitions I always liked that someone said years ago was love is a feeling you feel when you're feeling a feeling you never felt before. <laughs> Sounds kind of good, doesn't it? It's a feeling you never felt before, but then someone kind of ruined that by saying, you know, the first time I touched a hot stove, that was a feeling I never felt before, and that's sure not love, is it? And, and so we have to dig a little deeper. But I think we kind of get the idea of what love means, but do we really understand what love demands? What does love demand of me? I mean, we look at the, the husband-wife relationship, and you understand it's more than just saying I love you. Parents to their children, it's more than saying I love you. And when it comes to our relationship with God, there's more to it than just mere words or mere feelings. Probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible, you see it up on the screen here, is John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, how much do you love us? And he said, I'll show you how much I love you. And he showed it in the greatest way possible. He gave his only son on the cross of Calvary. We had the Lord's Supper a moment ago thinking about the death of Christ upon, his, upon the cross and what it means to us. But God says, I'm not just going to say I love you. I'm not gonna, going to just claim to be love. I'm going to show it to you. He gave his son because he wanted us to be saved. God's love demanded that. If he wanted a loving relationship with us, we've sinned, we've fallen short, and the only way you can have that loving relationship is for a proper sacrifice to be made. And God was willing to send his son as that proper, perfect sacrifice. The demands of love. Let's turn it around the other side. We understand God's love demanded certain things, that he sent his son to die for us, that he provided for us a way of salvation because he loves us so much. He, he demonstrated his love to us. But what does our love of God demand of us? Because many times I think people look at... at saying I love God or I believe in God and they think that feeling of love or that um, pro um, proclaiming of faith is all that it takes. I think as we look a little bit more we'll see that love demands a little bit more of us than that. When we look at the demands of love, first of all, God requires an unconditional love. God's love, our love of God demands that we love him unconditionally. Now there's a lot of reasons to love God. God is love. We love him because he first loved us. But sometimes I'm afraid that we can put conditions on our love. God, you know, I'll serve you, I'll love, I'll love you, I'll, I'll believe in you, but you've got to get me out of this situation that I'm in. <laughs> Take these difficulties away. God, 
I, I love you if you'll make cert uh, this certain person get well or if you'll help this certain thing work out for me. We put conditions there. You know, what, what, we need to, what we need to understand is we can't put those conditions there. Look at God again. Romans 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God could have said, look, when you deserve it, I'll show my love to you. When, when you reach a certain level of goodness and perfection, then I'll send my son to die for you. There's a problem with that. We'll never reach that that level of perfection or goodness, will we? We sin, we fall short, the wages of sin is death, we can't do it. But God demonstrated his love toward us while we were sinners. While we were at odds with God, when we were enemies of God, he sent his son to die for us. He didn't wait until we deserved it. He sent, he sent his son when we needed him, because we needed him. And so God demands of us an unconditional love. In, in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, we're not going to read this now, but this afternoon on the devotional, we'll look at the Good Samaritan. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And you think about it for a moment. You look at that story, and, and you can look at it from the point of view of the one that was hurt and injured. You look at it from who stopped and who didn't stop. You had a couple of men that were very religious, men that went by on the other side. They didn't want to get involved. Maybe they, they were afraid of a dangerous situation, that something could happen to them. Perhaps they didn't want to be unclean ceremonially. Uh, or whatever it may be, but, but whatever the case may be, they didn't get involved. But then the Samaritan, that was a person that most people around there that were Jews wouldn't want to have anything to do with, was the one who stopped. He got involved. He did what was necessary to help this person and then carried him somewhere to make sure that he was well taken care of and said he'd follow up on him later. I mean, he did everything he could to help this person. What could that person do for him in return? Well, nothing. He wasn't sure if the man was going to live or die. What could he do for him in return? He was a Samaritan. Perhaps that person wouldn't even want to have anything to do with him when he found out who he was. I mean, he could have looked at the person and said, you know, because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, I don't want to help you. Because, you know, you wouldn't do it for me. I'm not going to do it for you. I mean, he could have assumed certain things. He could have said, I'll do it if I can get him awake enough and say, look, you know, I'll do this, but you're going to owe me greatly. He didn't do any of that. He showed love. He showed that he was a neighbor to this person. He cared about that person and showed that to him. It, there weren't any conditions placed there. He put himself at risk. He did what he could. And God requires that type of love for us toward him and toward our fellow man as well. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in verse 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's kind of the way we work, isn't it? You love those that are your family, that are your neighbors, that are your friends, that are like you. But if somebody is your enemy, somebody you don't like, somebody that's different, we can tend to be hateful toward them. But Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies. What do you mean love your enemies, Jesus? Bless those who curse you. Someone curses you, you don't curse them back. They say bad things, you don't say bad things back. He says you bless them. He says, do good to those who hate you. Don't just ignore them. He said, do good to them. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And the implication there is not you pray for their damnation. <laughs> You're praying for them. Maybe praying for them to have a, a humble heart. Praying for them to have a, a forgiving heart, you know, um, a repentant heart. And for you to have a forgiving heart as well. But he says, you pray for them. You do good to them. You bless them. You demonstrate your love to them. And it's not that they can do anything back for you. You know, sometimes we can be loving to someone and we know they're going to do as much or more back to us in return. But God requires an unconditional love. We love God because he is God, because he is love. And we don't place conditions upon that because God is deserving of our love. We love our fellow man because, you know, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we're required to do that. And so we learn to do good, to say good things, to pray for others as well. The demands of love. The demands of love as well, God requires an active love. An active love. It's one thing to say, I love you. It's another thing to show it. You know, we can look at a marriage relationship and if the husband and wife just tell each other, I love you, but they never show it, that's not, it's not going to be that much of a relationship. A parent tells a child, I love you, and yet they never give them anything to eat. They don't put clothes on their back. Don't give them a roof over their head. 
they, they may abuse them or maybe just neglect them, whatever it may be. But we understand if there's true love there, there's going to be some actions involved. We kind of touched on that already in the lesson. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you really love me, you're going to do what I say. And you can look at that thing where he said God gives unconditional love. God does extend his love you know, unconditionally. He, he extended it while we were yet sinners when we didn't deserve it. He offers to us his love. He offers to us his grace and mercy. But that doesn't mean there are not anything, there's not anything required on our part to receive the ultimate benefit of that love. God extends his love. God extends his mercy and his grace. But God does require a response of us if we want to reap in eternity the benefits of that with an eternal home with God in heaven. Jesus said, look, if you love me, keep my commandments. What do you mean, Jesus? Go on over in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. And Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. A lot of folks in the world, they say, Lord, Lord, or I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, or he's the Lord of my life. And he said, but not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not enough just to express your faith or just to say, I believe. He says, but it's he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You have to do the Father's will. And then he gives a judgment picture here. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? You know, look how religious we were. You know, we, we served you, God. We, we did a lot of great things. But then the Lord said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What was wrong? They said, Jesus, we believe you're Lord. But they really didn't allow him to be Lord of their life. They didn't do the will of the Father who was in heaven. They practiced lawlessness. In other words, God has given us a law to follow. There are commands there to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. There are commands as far as worship and as far as service to, uh, is concerned of putting that love into action. You know, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus says. But on judgment day, as we look at it, we can tell the Lord we love you all we want to. But have we shown it? There's a number of judgment scenes given in the scripture, and you see in those, you know, a given an account of our life, the good that we have done or maybe have not done as well. Not that we're earning our salvation, no, but we're submitting ourselves to the will of God. In John 15 and verse 14, Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. There's action required. And we can understand that in every other relationship in life, that there's action to back up that, that proclamation of love. But somehow I think many times people fall short in understanding that if we love God, it demands action on our part. Action that demands, like for a person that's not a Christian, to say, you know, God, I love you enough. I'm going to repent of my sins. I don't want to keep living in sin anymore. I don't want to be in bondage or slave to unrighteousness and sin, as Romans 6 talks about. As Romans 9, 10, uh, um, Romans um, 9, 8, and 9 says, or 10, 8, 8 through 10, I'll get that scripture right. We need to confess our faith if we, want, you know, if we want to be acceptable to him. Are we willing to confess? Do we love him enough to not be ashamed of him, but to confess our faith in him? Are we loving him enough to be buried with him in baptism, to rise up in newness of life, to allow his blood to cleanse us, to realize we cannot do it ourselves? As a Christian, do I love him enough to come together to worship him, to, to, to worship God in spirit and in truth, to worship him according to the commands of God? Do I love him enough day in and day out to serve him, to, to humble myself and become obedient and to live, to live the Christian life? Love demands that. And then finally, when it comes to the demands of love, God requires tough love. Tough love. We hear tough love being talked about. And I think you used to hear more about it than you do now because... It's not politically correct to talk about tough love so much. When we talk about discipline, and, and you know, it's, it's hard sometimes for parents to want to practice proper discipline because they want to show their child they love them, and so they'll give that child anything they want, do whatever that child wants, and they don't want to um, correct that child in any way. Now, I'm not talking about abuse, whether physical or emotional or whatever it may be, or you know, mental abuse. I'm, I'm talking about proper discipline. There are times that tough love is required that we have to tell our children no, that we have to punish them in certain ways because we love them and we want them to be what they should be. They have to know certain boundaries. They need to learn to respect authority, whether in the home or in society. If they don't respect it in the home, they're not going to respect it in society as well. And we see some problems with that in the world today. But God requires tough love. 
in a number of different ways. There is that disciplinary side of it. In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the discipline and chastening of the Lord. That if a parent loves their child, they're going to discipline at times. In the same way, God will discipline us at times. Not because he doesn't love us, but because he wants us to be what we should be. And he's trying to bring us back to him in certain ways. You can see that in his relationship to Israel. Where at times they had to be punished or carried in captivity. But it brought them back to God once again. You know, God would bring up an enemy against them to bring them back to him. But it was love, and we can see that in them. But we need to understand that as well. The scripture is on the board, um, the wall is Matthew 10, 37. It says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You're going to see one of the demands of love here as well. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He doesn't say you don't love your parents. He doesn't say you don't love your children. But what he's saying is, what is your first and foremost love? The demands of love when it comes to our love of God is to love him first and foremost. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6 and verse 33 says. Love demands it. To love God first and foremost. And, and that can be tough at times because there's some people that are afraid to become a Christian because they're afraid of what their family might say. You know, I've talked to people that said, you know, my parents would never, ever allow me to become a Christian. Or my husband or my wife or, or this person or that person. You know, I'll lose all my friends if I become a Christian. That can be tough, can't it, when it comes to those relationships? But God requires tough love. It can be difficult at times to live the Christian life. But again, we have to tough it out and do what we're supposed to do and live like we're supposed to live. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. He said, you can't live like the world. If you love God, you don't live like the world lives. You don't do the same thing the world is doing. You don't have fellowship with those things. Oh, it, there may be some friendships that have to be severed, some relationships that, that can't continue on at least like they were. It can change things in the workplace as well, can it? But he says God requires tough love. And so as we look at love, do you love God? Do you, do you truly love the Lord? Well, how much do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord like we've talked about this morning in a way that does require much from us? I mean, not where we, we put certain requirements upon God and say, God, you know, I'll give my life to you or live for you if you do this, this, and this. God's already done enough. He's done everything that needs to be done. He offers to us eternal life. Why, could we, why should we require anything else of the Lord than that? Are we willing to meet the demands of love by putting our love into action, giving ourselves to Christ, to being baptized into Christ? Or if we're not walking in the light, to come back to the light and seek God's forgiveness and God's God's, um, follow God's way as well. How much do we love the Lord? If you need to respond to the invitation, whatever way you may need to respond, we encourage you at this time, we invite you, won't you come? Show your love to the Lord. Won't you come out together? We stand and sing.
We're certainly happy to have everyone with us this morning. We uh, appreciate your presence. We appreciate your participation in the service. We appreciate your presence.